Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm your host and all-around computer geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting October 29th, 2012. During this week's episode, I'll cover a couple SCADA and ICS-related stories, a couple very important data breaches, a story on how some authorities turned the tables on a bot herder, and finally, I'll share another interesting game-related security story. Let's start with the two SCADA stories. The first is a story about researchers disclosing a serious root shell vulnerability in the CodeSys ICS software. Essentially, this CodeSys software is, is a program that allows a programmable logic controller or PLC engineers to create ladder logic for their PLC boards. Uh, it's software that about 261 different manufacturers use uh, for their PLC software. Anyways, long story short, some researchers found some vulnerabilities in this software. Essentially, when you use this software, there's a runtime you put on the PLC. And in most cases, this runtime uh, has root access. Uh, these researchers found that, that you could gain access to this runtime over TCP IP networks and then leverage a vulnerability that allows you to gain unauthenticated root access of that PLC board. You can then upload files, download files, and do a lot of modifications. So this is a pretty serious vulnerability in a piece of software that's used by many ICS manufacturers. On top of disclosing this particular flaw, the researchers also released some exploit code, so this issue is out there. Hopefully these manufacturers will patch soon. The second SCADA related story comes to us from the 12th ICS Cybersecurity Conference. Uh, this is a conference for industrial control system people to talk about cybersecurity. Apparently, two different research groups were going to release details about vulnerabilities in nuclear power plants and some of the software they used. However, an unnamed power plant uh, vendor actually threatened to sue these researchers if they disclosed uh, their information. As a result, they, they did not disclose the details they were planning to at these particular conferences. One of the organizers of the conference did talk about the planned research that they were going to talk about, and apparently these researchers, among other things, had, had found uh, public access to over 500,000 different industrial control systems online. So they wanted to disclose a lot of the insecurities with current industrial control systems and probably SCADA systems as well. In any case, because of the threatened lawsuit, we don't really know what they were going to disclose. And frankly, I actually think this sets a bad precedence. On one hand, I'm for something called responsible disclosure. I do not think you should disclose security vulnerabilities until you let the vendor know first and then give them a significant amount of time, of you know, how much ever time they need to fix these vulnerabilities. And that's probably especially important if this is a vulnerability in nuclear power plants. You really should should give them the benefit of the doubt and allow them time to patch. However, apparently some people say uh, these researchers did try to let the vendor know and they weren't reacting to disclosure, which is why they were going to publicly disclose this information. In any case, this is an interesting story. It does show that attackers and researchers alike are targeting SCADA and ICS equipment. So if you're in that industry, you should keep security at the top of your mind. Next, let's talk about a couple security breaches from the week. The first has to do with with a couple attackers gaining access to a Texan uh, credit union. I believe it was the Abilene uh, Federal Telco Credit Union. Anyway, some attackers somehow gained access to an employee computer, perhaps through malware or maybe through some sort of insider access. Once they gained access to the employee computer, the attackers also were able to gain access to the credentials used uh, for the bank to log into the Experian credit reporting or scoring system. Experian is one of your the credit scoring agencies we all use to, to learn our credit score. Once they had these credentials, they technically 
technically had access to millions of, of credit scores and, and the data that goes along with that, which is social security number, date of birth, and lots and lots of financial information. According to forensics for this particular breach, the attackers downloaded about 847 records. So they've only confirmed that 847 Experian customers have their data out there. But that's all they know for sure. The, the attackers may have downloaded more for all we know. So that's one really big data breach. The second is a huge data breach involving South Carolina's Department of Revenue. Some attackers using an undisclosed method were able to gain access to the Department of Revenue information and all the taxpayer information for South Carolina. This means that attackers have around 3.6 million social security numbers. And the Department of Revenue didn't encrypt these social security numbers. So they know for sure these attackers have all the, the South Carolina taxpayer social security numbers. Now they claim they don't know what other data the attacker has, but other pundits have said when you store social security numbers, you store all the other personal information too, like your name and address and date of birth. So you got to assume these attackers have a lot of information about all of South Carolina's taxpayers. So you might be asking what you should do if you live in South Carolina and you're, you're worried about this breach, or even if you're an Experian user and you're worried about the Texan bank breach. Well, what you really need to do is you need some sort of identity theft monitoring. If you live in South Carolina, apparently you can call a number and they'll offer you at least one year free of ID theft monitoring from Experian. But there's many other services and, and, and many other credit uh, uh, reporting services you can go to and they'll keep a tab on your, your accounts and if anyone tries to claim new accounts in your name, they can send you an alert and a warning. So that's one thing you can think about if you're ever in a situation where you think your personal data or your, your identity might have been stolen. Next, let's talk about a story where some authorities turned the tables on a Russian bot herder. Back in 2008, there was this political uh, situation between Russia and Georgia, where Russia was doing a physical uh, military occupation of Georgia, but at the same time, there were some cyber attacks happening from Russian IP space to some Georgian networks. And during that time, a new botnet came into existence that, that people largely called the Jorbot. Uh, anyways, there's been a bunch of research into that botnet, including some research by the Georgian CERT team and ESET. They learned a lot about that botnet, including that when it infected very targeted victim computers, it would actually search for very specific files on those computers that had a, a very specific string, like a, a Georgia-NATO agreement or something like that. Anyways, this botnet was still active and the Georgian CERT team was still researching it, trying to gain access to command and control structure and so on. So what they recently did is they infected a lab computer with Jorbot. And on that lab computer, they placed a booby trap file, which they called Georgia NATO agreement .zip. And this file they put there specifically since they knew the attacker would be looking at that file and be lured by it. Of course, they were right. The attacker found the file and ran it. This, of course, actually turned the tables on him and infected him with some spyware Trojans that the Georgian CERT team had control of. So they gained access to the attacker's computer and were able to gather a lot of details on him, including even taking a picture of him using his own webcam, which they've posted online. So I find this a fascinating and interesting story where we actually use the bot herder's own technologies against him to actually find out who he is and hopefully we'll hear a story in the future of whether or not they catch or prosecute this guy. Finally, since it seems like I have some fellow gamers out there, I'm going to end this episode with another game-related security incident. This week, Borderlands 2, a very popular first-person shooter game, had a new virus. Uh, they call it the Graveyard Virus. Apparently, the Xbox version of Borderlands 2 has this very particular situation. Some modders or hackers found that they could actually modify the Borderlands 2 save file and gain access to this hardcore mode that was in Borderlands 2 code but wasn't exposed to the public. However, by gaining access to this hardcore mode, it actually would, would cause uh, the game to delete your save file. If your character died, he wouldn't respawn. But what makes this even worse is if someone that modified his game save file to access this hardcore mode plays online 
anyone else that plays online with that particular character has their save files automatically modified with the same hardcore mode. This means they essentially affect him with this situation where your save file disappears and you, you won't be reborn after you die. So this is a pretty big incident. If you accidentally play with the wrong person, you may lose your entire save, which most of you don't want. Now, uh, the manufacturers of Borderland do know about this. Uh, they are trying to fix it. But in the meantime, to be safe, you might want to avoid playing uh, online in public spaces unless you're playing with people you know and trust. Because I don't believe they've completely patched this incident yet and it is still happening to some people. So if you're a Borderlands 2 player, be careful out there. And there you have it. That's another week in security. I hope you found some of this information useful. As always, if you'd like more regular security news, please follow the blog WatchGuard Security Center. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, and I also post for WatchGuard Tech. Thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.